I'm going to begin now by talking about the economic effects of the Black Death in uh, late medieval society and heading into the Renaissance. If you think about uh, the way medieval society was structured, it's commonly been referred to as a pyramid. You have the peasants who are farming the land, um, and you have knights, and then lords, uh, lords and bishops, and then the king. So the idea is uh, that the king divides the land among his lords who are called vassals or subordinates to the king. Uh, the lords hold this land and in return they're expected to provide military service and soldiers to the king. The lords in turn uh, have vassals who are knights. They subdivide the land among their knights and the knights uh, have peasants or serfs on their land and the peasants are expected to work the land for the lords. Uh, in return, they get to keep some of the, uh, the food that they cultivate, but some goes uh, to the knights who control the land. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the typical uh, medieval structure. This structure is challenged by uh, the Black Death, um, and uh, this happens for a few reasons. Uh, the first is that you have a massive population decline as a result of the Black Death. And this means that demand for food decreases. And people no longer need, um, uh, people or the society no longer needs to produce the same amount of food that it did before. At the same time, a demand for labor increases. And that's because among the peasant classes, uh, public health is uh, more fragile. More people die as a result of the Black Death from these classes. And so this means suddenly it's harder to find uh, laborers and you're getting less money for uh, the food that you sell. So this means that uh, knights and lords are the ones who especially are struggling with the economic effects of the Black Death. And there's an effort in England, and this is an, an effort that we see elsewhere, to try and counter this effect. Um, and this uh, effort is called the Statute of Labourers. Uh, this is a statute that's passed uh, into law by the English king at the time. And the idea is to set a maximum wage on, uh, on labourers. Uh, what's the reason for this? The reason is that for the first time uh, on a consistent basis in medieval history, you're seeing laborers actually shop around uh, to see where they can find the best wages. And so the idea is uh, previously that you were a peasant, you were tied to the land that you grew up in. That was land that was controlled by a knight. You went to work for that knight. Uh, you received uh, a portion of the food that you were able to cultivate. But now we're seeing a situation where people uh, are wanting to be paid in currency. So this gives them more power, more flexibility than if they're being paid in, uh, in grain, in food. Uh, and also they're willing to shop around to try and find a lord who will pay them uh, more. And so the idea is behind the statute of labor is an effort by the king and the lords uh, to stop this, to say, no, you can only pay laborers a certain, uh, a certain amount. You can only pay laborers uh, $9 an hour. You can't have someone down the street paying them 10 or 11. That's disadvantaging in particular the knights who are in the middle here who can't pay those higher wages. Um, another effort to um, rebalance the economy in favor of the lords and the knights is the institution of a poll tax. Uh, poll tax is just a flat tax on individuals. Uh, this means that it disproportionately affects uh, the peasants who, let's say, your tax, your poll tax is $20 a year. Everyone's paying that. That's a greater percentage of the income of a peasant or a serf. And so that's uh, disadvantaging um, them and working to the advantage of the lords and the vassals who are paying the same amount, but it's a smaller percentage of their annual income. This leads to what's known as the Peasants' Revolt. And we see Peasants' Revolts not just in Europe, but around, uh, not just in England, but across uh, Europe. Now, the thing is, these revolts can only be put down through the power of the king. That's what we see when we read primary sources from this period, that the power of the lords and the nobles, this middle two sections of the pyramids, has been very much reduced uh, as a result of the Black Death and the economic effects of the Black Death. And so increasingly, you're seeing society look like a much flatter pyramid. 
It's a flatter pyramid and the king is becoming more powerful. But armies are becoming more directly loyal to the king uh, rather than to uh, your local lord and your local knight. Speaking of armies, the other great event, the other great challenge of the 14th century is the Hundred Years' War. The Hundred Years' War is the culmination of the rivalry and the intermingling of the English and the French thrones whose interests have been intersecting and bumping into each other for several hundred years at this point. So these kingdoms were initially separate, but then and uh, then in the 10th century, you have Viking raids in France. And the way the French king settles this is that he grants the Vikings land, they become his vassals in exchange for them not raiding anymore. And the land that he grants them is in the north of France called the Duchy of Normandy. And so these Vikings who settle there become known as Normans. After this happens, uh, the Duke of Normandy, who is a vassal of the King of France, uh, and this particular Duke, William the Conqueror, conquers the Kingdom of England. So he becomes the King of England and also the Duke, uh, but he remains the Duke of Normandy. And he passes these titles on to his successors. Now, the challenge is that as the King of England, these rulers are the peers and the equals of the Kings of France. As the Dukes of Normandy, they're their vassals and they owe loyalty to them. And so uh, there's kind of a, there's a disconnect there. And this connect, be, this connect becomes more apparent and more um, difficult uh, by the fact that the successes of William the Conqueror through intelligent marriage alliances uh, gain control of all the areas that you see colored in in red on this map. This becomes known as the Angevin Empire. So this is a massive expansion uh, and you have these Angevin emperors who control most of France and all of England, but at least in theory, they're still subject to the King of France, who rules this area in dark blue here uh, with the city of Paris in it. And so the French kings have become very weak, but they still claim to be the overlords of, uh, of the English kings and the Angevin emperors. In the 13th century, however, the French restore control of their lands and the English kings become weaker. The French monarchy becomes the most powerful monarchy in Europe. By 1328, however, they faced a dynastic crisis. Um, and so you can see this crisis on the family tree that I provided here. So the French monarchy continually has very, one very obvious heir. It means the passing succession from one generation to the other is very straightforward. And this is what's happened all the way up until Philip IV. And then all of Philip IV's children die very young. They die before they can have any children of their own. At this point, Edward III of England proposes himself as the successor to the French crown on the grounds that he is the son of the daughter of Philip IV. So he very graciously offers to become the king of France. Uh, he uh, reignites or he uh, reminds the French of English claims to rule over these lands in the west of France. And the French don't like that. And so they appeal to a principle through Salic law. And this principle of Salic law is that succession to the throne can only be, um, can only be passed down uh, through the male line. So they say this connection doesn't count because you have to use a woman in, in, order to, uh, in order to make your claim. And so instead they go back, what's the way that we can connect to the previous king only through male descendants is through the brother of Philip IV, Charles of Valois, and his son, Philip, now becomes Philip VI. Now, Philip VI, uh, is uh, who's uh, this figure here? This is Edward III. Philip VI is uh, uh, in a precarious situation here, and uh, he perhaps feels quite vulnerable, and so he attacks English interests. Uh, he attacks the Low Countries. Uh, that's uh, modern day Belgium, Holland, and Northeast France. Why does he do that? He does that because uh, this is the trading route that the English are using. Think about that map that we looked at at the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, it showed that the way that England was connected to trade in Europe was uh, through the Low Countries. And so Philip VI attacks the English there. He also develops an alliance with the Scots and he encourages uh, the Scots to attack England and to weaken the English in this way. 
And finally, he attacks the region of Gascony. That's this region that's in gray here. It's the last area of the old Angevin Empire that's still under English control. And so Philip in uh, this period is trying to weaken the English and to weaken Edward, who he sees as a threat to himself on the throne of France. He still feels a little insecure on uh, the French throne. And so in the end, this is going to lead to war. Uh, Philip III claims the French throne on the grounds of being descended from uh, Philip IV, uh, older French king, and uh, he invades France. Now, at the beginning of the war, the French had a much larger population, uh, somewhere between 12 and 20 million, as opposed to only 4 million in England. However, the English have a very powerful army. Uh, it was uh, probably the best army in Europe at the time. Uh, it was uh, professionally trained and it was a professional army that was loyal to the king. So here we see the centralization of uh, royal power. That's a theme of this course that we just talked about in connection with the economic effects of the Black Death. We see this uh, with the English monarchy, that instead of having to rely on your lords to be loyal to you and your knights to be loyal to you, having to work with them. Instead, the English kings are working directly with uh, the troops. They're hiring the troops for a wage. It gives them more control over the troops. Um, they're not having to work with someone who controls a large section of their land. Uh, instead, they, are, um, they have direct control over who their troops are. And so uh, these troops are professional and they are also making, taking advantage of the new military technologies that are being used at the time, in particular uh, the uh, technology of archery. And so you can see that depicted here with the use of the longbow. And so uh, Edward I, the grandfather of, of Edward III, come back from wars in Wales, recognized the use of the longbow for a smaller force with less money uh, to fight from a distance, to be able to fire missiles uh, at the opposing forces from a distance. And so he encourages, uh, he sets up archery targets in all the towns in England so that the English will learn to be good at archers. And the English use this technique at the Battle of Crecy in 1346. This is the first major battle of the war. You can see what the battlefield looks like today. The English position themselves at the top of the hill behind raised stakes. They dare the French knights to charge at them. The French are blind. The knights are charging through the mud and they're getting peppered by the arrows of the English. They're unable to get up the slopes in large numbers and the English are able to defeat them. And this shows that these new methods of waging war using archery fighting from a distance, uh, these uh, can counteract the power of the charge of uh, medieval knights. Previously, this had been the way that you won uh, battles. Uh, you had uh, powerful knights on horseback. They would charge the battlefield, scatter the enemy. And this is a new strategy that the English are using to counteract the larger numbers that the French have uh, and, um, and to take advantage of this. And this is enabling the English to win the early battles of the war. So it marks a way uh, in which warfare is changing. And we're going to see this continue in the early years of the war. At the Battle of Sluys, this is a naval battle, so it's a little bit different. But once again, the English are more mobile, more maneuverable. They're able to capture the French fleet. This is important and significant because it means that from this point onwards, the English are able to land troops anywhere along the French coast with relatively little opposition. And finally, at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, uh, the English employ the same tactics again. The French still try and attack them out in the open. They're still defeated uh, by the English, who at this point are under the command of Edward III's son, Edward III's oldest son, the Black Prince. And they're defeated so badly that the French king is captured. And after these defeats, the French are forced to agree to a peace called the Treaty of Brittany. We'll talk about that in the next video.